Okay, so, right, now, uh, okay, here, now we have a pretty bad one. So, um, let me set my exercise so I can do this. All right, so, um, yeah, so first I'm first going to talk about myself a little bit and uh, give you an introduction to the series. Then we're going to, I'm going to introduce you to the world of fundamental particles and forces. And then lastly, we're going to talk about um, the importance of what the Higgs boson is, what it does, and what, why it's important. All right, so, hello. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, an abbreviated life history of myself. So it starts actually, well, it doesn't actually start in Western suburbs. It starts um, in California. But I went to high school in Naperville Central. Um, so I'm somewhat liberal. My parents are in fact here in the audience. Um, and from there, I went to um, the Wild West. I went to the University of California at Berkeley for um, my undergraduate. And I studied physics and math there. And that's where I first started working um, in particle physics. So as an undergraduate, I worked um, on one of the experiments at the Fermi Lab. Um, I worked on the CDF experiment, which was one of the Hadron Collider experiments running um, there. And that's what really got me into doing particle physics research. So after I um, went, after I graduated from uh, undergrad, I took a year off and I went to France. Um, and I spent a year as a Fulbright scholar working in the French lab. And that was my first introduction to the LHC. So I worked with the French group who, was, um, who were building part of the Atlas detector. Um, and I worked on some of that construction and then also um, some simulation studies. Or what we were trying to figure out if we could see certain models at, at the LHC. Um, and then afterwards, I went back to Berkeley. So, um, I have a, a, a big love of that place, and so I went back there for grad school. So I spent the next six years there, um, and I did my PhD on uh, the LHC. And so this is me from March 30th, 2010, after I think what was my only all-nighter ever, um, which was the night right before um, first collision happened at the LHC. So I had the, I was lucky enough to be at CERN for that event, and I had to work all night to make, <laughs> to make sure that the beams were actually going to glide, and I will talk about that um, in the next lecture when we discuss accelerators. But it was a lot of fun, and it was a really great way to experience the startup of what I hope you'll see over the course of this lecture series is uh, a truly unique scientific endeavor. And so after I finished um, my thesis in 2011, I came here to the Eureka Fermi Institute, and I've been working um, with people um, on the LHC episode. So, before we delve into the details of, um, of you know, particle physics and, um, and, and some of its particles, I just want to give you a broad overview of what the LHC is and kind of the focus of what we're talking about the entire time. So, this is the LHC in 60 seconds. So, um, we have the LHC is an accelerator in Geneva, Switzerland. It crosses the border between um, Switzerland here and, and France over so here, and I think the border is over here, right? Somewhere along there. Um, it's a tunnel on the ground um, that accelerates uh, protons um, to 99.99, no, there's six nines, um, <laughs> three percent of the speed of light. Um, and this is done with 10,000 scientists and engineers from 85 countries all over the world. So I, I, I think it's pretty fair to be able to say that there's there's nothing, there's no, nothing that involves anywhere else that involves as many people from as many countries working collaboratively towards one goal. So it's a pretty special thing to be a part of. So we started collisions in 2009 um, at a very low energy. Um, and then in, in March 2010, we started at the high energy. And we finished our first run um, of data taking at the end of 2012. Um, so we're shut down. There is no LHC running right now, but we are turning on again um, at higher energy in 2015. And so next week we'll talk a lot about what you know what these different energies mean, what what's going on in the accelerator, why it's shut down, things like that. Um, next week. And just to give you some more impressive statistics about the LHC and the amount of data we're producing, so it creates 15 petabytes of data a year, and so. What's, what's edified? Well, it's a unit of information, essentially. 
And if you're going to put this in terms of things that maybe we're somewhat familiar, so um, it's 10% of Facebook storage, so Facebook does have a lot more information, you know, like LAT, you know, it's kind of bad, it's just how, how you think of it as it is. Um, and it's 40, if you took the DNA of everybody in the U.S. and you stored it, it's 45 times um, the information content of, of uh, all of the people in the U.S. with DNA. So I, I think this is a pretty impressive statistic. It also, also shows you this is kind of weird when you think about Facebook in terms of DNA. <laughs> <laughs> but so we, I will touch upon a little bit upon the connection to particle physics and what we so call big data, because we are pioneers of this whole big data thing that's going on with um, all the web companies. Um, was there a question? No? Okay. I, I please, you know, please um, do ask questions at whatever point you um, feel like it sets me to understand or you want to know more about the thing. The total budget of the LHC is $9 billion, um, and that's been funded by the global community. Um, and then, of course, what's motivating this whole talk is that the Hague boson was discovered on July 4th, 2012. Where we, as you'll see, it, will, it is when we finally mass enough evidence to say yes, we've seen um, the Hague boson. What is happening that accelerates over between? So they are ripping out parts. So, okay, so, <laughs> so the saga of the LHC is that it was supposed to run at high energy right away. But we started, they turned it on and um, they found that there was a fault in the way that the magnets controlled the energy within them. And so it kind of, a part of it basically exploded. Um, so that's very dangerous condition. And that, that shut down, that shut down the LHC for an additional year and a half. Um, so what they're doing now is they're going and fixing their fault. So they're ripping apart I think, almost every single magnet in the LHC and putting in protection so that that doesn't happen again. So it's a very, it's a very big and ambitious project, and that's why it takes essentially two years to do it. Um, any more questions?
rely on your feedback and your questions to make it you know, the most useful for you. So uh, my current this audience is quite interesting. So I, I, uh, I look forward to that. All right, so this, I'm going to go over now this is the schedule lecture. So today we're going to talk about the introduction of the student model and who goes on. Very welcome to the theater. It was in the spirit of an old um, dissection theater. So dissection is just like a little bit of gas in the theater if you're watching dissect. So I was really, I was going to take this thing goes on here. My <laughs>
And so what you can think about it is as the periodic table of indivisible matter. So this is a periodic table. You know, people are typically pretty comfortable with the, the, I mean, you learn this when you're in, in high school chemistry. And what you, what you learn when you're in high school chemistry is that there's structure to this table, that there's an organizing principle in terms of elements that are related by, in this case, it's their electron uh, shell structure. Um, and and this, this, this table itself encodes a lot of information about the way atoms um, interact. Um, similarly, we have that this is the standard model of particle physics. It contains three groups of different types of particles. There's quarks, there's leptons, and there's um, forces, or what I'll call in a minute, um, bosons. And, and this table uh, characterizes how each of these particles interacts. Um, and so I'm going to go through that in detail in a minute. And I'm going to put this you know, star here. And we think that, that we think that all of these particles, to the best of our knowledge, are indivisible. indivisible. Um, of course, there are some cases, there are some theories where they're uh, particularly the quarks are, are not um, uh, indivisible. All right, so let's, um, before we delve into the world of semi-atomic particles, let's get a sense of scale for subatomic particles. So this is a human, it's about one meter. Um, an atom is 10 to the 10, so that's um, uh, 10 billion times smaller than a human. Um, and then you have a nuclei, which is again four times smaller. Um, and then you have the proton, which um, is the constituent of the nucleus, and that's 10 to the 15 times smaller than a human. And then finally, you get the quark. So we have the upper limit on the size of the quark is uh, 10 to the 18 meters. Um, so this, we're dealing with stuff that is really, really, really small. However, I do want to give you a comparison to the size of the universe, right? Because we, we kind of, we use ourselves and our experience as, as a sort of standard measure, our standard ruler. So how do we, how does this scale, going from one meter down to 10 to the 15, you know, 10 to the 18, size smaller compared with the entire universe? So if we look in, in, our, in our local um, area, the Earth's radius is 10 to the 7 meters. So that's still, an atom is, is a lot smaller with respect to us than we are with respect to the Earth. Um, but then once we get up to the Milky Way, so what you can think about is the quark is, the upper limit on the quark is about, this, is about the same size as the difference between us and the whole Milky Way. So I can just have one of those things to and then, if you look at the universe, the universe is enormous. And the universe is 10 to the 26 um, times bigger than us. And this number is almost incomprehensible. So that just gives you a sense of scale that no matter, you know, we're just delving into something that's 10 to 18 times smaller, but then the universe is, you know, much, much, much bigger. Uh-huh. What is the sense of size? <coughs> it's the meaning. What, what, in what sense do you speak of? The size of, uh, let's say, a quark or a proton, how do you measure it? I thought that they quit speaking about the size of the electron about right. 100 years ago. Right, so, so there is a way, so the way that we basically, so, so the way that you found out that, um, that an atom has size, right, this is the Rutherford's experiment. So basically what he did, right, right sorry, where you found out that the, the nucleus had a finite size. So, and that an atom wasn't just something the same size as an electron. What he did was he took a beam and his, uh, particles and he scattered it at a foil, and then he found that some particles found scattered. <coughs> so what you can think about doing is taking a beam of particles and shooting it sort of across this proton, so to speak. Um, and um, if the proton hits here, then it kind of won't get deflected, but if it hits one of the quarks, then it will come back at you with high amount of energy. And you can, in a sense, use that to map out the size of the quark. And we know that we haven't seen anything that is smaller than 10 to the minus 18, 18 meters, and so that's an upper limit on the physical size of the quark. So, so the idea is that if I had just like, if I was doing this macroscopically and I had some, some big thing, and I knew I had a little piece inside of it, I could just shoot a beam through it, and nothing would happen here, nothing would happen here, nothing would happen here. But then here, I get something back, and I, if I had a fine enough probe, so if I knew it was small enough, I would, I would hit nothing, 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 and then I would hit something, 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 and then I go back to nothing, nothing, nothing. And that's how you find this. And the way we do this, and so this is with, if 
I was doing this like macroscopic, macroscopic object, but I was doing this with something small, like do this by the wavelength of light. So the thing is, <laughs> I can use or wave the energy of a particle. So basically, as we'll talk about, energy of a particle corresponds to its wavelength. So um, you can the way you can think about this best is that um, it's in terms of light, in terms of photons. We know that really high energy light, like ultraviolet light, has a really short wavelength, the same as particles. So we can use particles that have really, really short wavelengths and see and use them to probe this, basically to do exactly this experiment. Where you see nothing, 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 and see something. And so that's how we basically determined that there were things that just worked, um, but we didn't, you know, we haven't seen anything. Uh, the universe on the slide is just the observable universe, right? Uh, yeah, this is the observable universe. Yes, exactly. So the, there's, we don't know how big, I mean, there's no way to define the universe um, that's unobservable. But this is accounting for the fact that the universe is accelerating. It's more than just in the, the ages of the universe times the speed of light. More questions? All right, so let's now, now that we have a sense of scale and what we're dealing with, let's talk about the standard model of particle physics. So as I mentioned before, this is the standard model. We look at its parts. So I'm going to start with the forces. So there's the photon, which um, is light, essentially. And it's the, what we call the mediator of the electromagnetic force. So we picture the electromagnetic force. This is the force that we're all pretty comfortable with. It's responsible for electricity um, and many other things. Um, then you have two particles called the W and Z bosons. Um, and these particles are responsible for things such as weak nuclear decay. So this is when you have a nuclear, in this case you have a neutron, um, and through the weak force, one of the D quarks, which is one of the contents of, of the neutron, becomes the U quark, um, and you get nuclear decay. Um, and then there's the, this blue one, which is strong force. And I'll go through each one of these in a little bit more detail in a couple slides. Um, but this is the strong force, and it's responsible for um, binding the, um, the nucleus together. So if you think about it, the nucleus is a bunch of positive charges in a very small scale. And so if we think about what we know from electromagnetism, like charges should repel each other. Um, the strong force is much stronger than the electromagnetic force. And so um, that overcomes the electromagnetic repulsion. And as you see, um, our, this is a very creative with what we name things. Strong, weak force for weak. We thought we'd run out of particles, and so that's why these two particles are called the W and Z. So yeah, the um part of our normal picture. And so um, here we have the boson, which is of course the, bulk, um, the focus of this lecture series. Um, and it gives particles mass. So this is critical, a critical mass, and we're familiar with it with a, a rally of, of bike riders trying to, um, they have a critical of mass to show that, you know, we just have to have important. So this Higgs particle is, um, is what we call this the uh, cornerstone of the standard model, or the keystone, sorry, of the standard model. Uh, uh, cap, the capstone. Um, and so it um, really is what does the whole thing together, as you'll we'll see. So these are the forces and the force carriers, and they act upon um, these particles, the quarks and the leptons. So we have the up and down quarks um, and the electrons, or which make up uh, normal matter. So the up and down quarks um, make up protons and neutrons, and the electrons make up orbits and atoms. Um, and then you have um, a suite of other particles. You have the charm and the strange quark, the top and the bottom quark, um, and then, in the, like, just like the electron, there's the muon, the tau, and then the associated neutrinos. We'll in a second. Right. So, as I just said, there's uh, six different types of quarks, um, and all of these particles interact via the strong, the electromagnetic, and the weak quark. So, in this kind of diagram, this is a similar diagram to the previous one. And here you can see that um, with what the particle interactions is contained in this little picture. So the quarks here um, are contained by the strong force, the electromagnetic, and the weak force. Um, and uh, there's also the leptons. So there's three charged leptons, which means these leptons have um, 
electric charge, you have the electron, and then there's the muon, and there's the tau. And all of these particles are exactly the same, except for the fact that the muon is heavier than the electron, and the tau is heavier than the muon. Um, and then lastly, you have the neutrinos. And so the neutrinos only interact via the weak force. So as I said, the weak force is really weak, so that means they don't interact very much. Um, but they are complete because the, the, the normal particles are the same on the fermions. So what you see is that it has some structure. In both cases, there are three generations of particles. Um, the lightest generation is stable, which means they don't decay, and that's why they make up our protons and our neutrons and um, electrons. And then these heavier versions, these are really just each each case here, each line, the blue, so the green is a heavier version of the blue, is a heavier version of the red. It's just that they, they share all the same other properties. Um, that's, that's repeated um, for the quarks and the charged leptons. The neutrinos are a little special. We don't actually we don't actually know if the green one is heavier than the blue is heavier than the red, but there's experiments that are trying to figure that out. Questions on this, of course. Yes. In your notes, you say there's a uh, eight types of um, <coughs> gluons, yes. but they're indistinguishable. Yes. So if they're indistinguishable, how do you know which one is that? So it comes out of um, it comes out of the theory. So that's not so. Okay. Well, there's oh, sorry. It's not exactly true. Um, there is a measurement that we can make that shows that basically quarks are interacting with eight different types um, of gluons. I will have to bring you the detail of that measurement next week because I don't know it off the top of my head. But it has been experimentally confirmed. And, and basically what, what, it, what it amounts to is we, we know how often a particle should interact. If there's only one one, then we see it interacting basically eight times as often. So we know that there's eight different types. Although we can't distinguish what they are. But the details of the experiment I don't have off the top of my head. More questions? <laughs> All right, so let's talk a minute about quarks and leptons mass. Since um, I was talking about um, the the fact that there were two different what we call generations of, of these particles and that they were heavier. So the quarks have very, very different masses. So the top quark, which is the, the heaviest quark um, ever observed, um, is 100,000 times heavier than the up quark, which is the lightest quark. So there's this huge difference um, in the scales. And this, this picture sort of shows you um, the relative sizes of the port, of the port. So the top port is this big blue one. Um, the next thing is the bottom port. And then we have the charm port, the strange port, and up and the down port. And for reference, this is the size of the proton. The proton um, is bigger than um, about is bigger than half of the port. Um, and then it's also the electron, which is really small. Um, the charged leptons, as I said, also have different masses, and the top neutrino, which is the heaviest neutrino, um, is 3,500 times heavier than the electron. So it doesn't have quite as big of um, a scale difference as um, the quarks do. Um, and then lastly, the neutrinos. The neutrinos have almost no mass. In fact, until 2001, we had no, you know, no concrete evidence that neutrinos have mass. And then in 2001, there was finally concrete evidence that they do have a really small mass. Um, and they are a million times lighter than the electrons. We don't actually know if there are masses, but we have an upper limit. We, we know that we have an, uh, an upper limit on it, and it's about a million times lighter than the electrons. And one of the outstanding problems of the CERN model, which the case discovery does not give us an answer for, is why these masses are so different. Um, so it's not some of the problems with their model, but it is what it is. Yes, you're right. That is a typo. typo. Yeah. yeah, sorry. The so it, should be, yeah, it, should, it should be the towel. Um, I left them not the neutrino. Um, is there a theoretical reason why there cannot be a generation uh, above or below the three that we know of? So um, there is a reason why there can't be. Um, basically, there are reasons why there can't be anything lighter than the three that we know of. So um, the reason is that the up and down quarks, the protons and electrons, are stable, which means they don't decay. And if um, if there was something lighter than an up and down quark 
then protons would decay and we wouldn't exist. So we know that the up and down torques are the lightest torques. And similarly, we know that the electron is the lightest lepton. However, there is nothing that says that there can't be heavier particles. So that is another question that the LHD trained. There's something special about a magic number of three, so there could be heavier um, force electrons. They'd have to be a lot heavier, otherwise we would have seen evidence of them already. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Dash, you have a question? Um, yeah. um, don't we believe that protons do decay just over very long time scales? Yeah, so um, it's looking, searching for proton decay is a um, is an active field of research. We know that it happens really, 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 really rarely. And um, that the half-life of a proton is um, longer than the age of the universe. Otherwise, too many protons would have decayed and we wouldn't have existed. Um, so it does decay. And even in the standard model, there are ways for um, it to decay, but at, at, at a rate so small, we'll never ever be able to observe it. Um, but some theories in your physics say that the proton can decay at a very small rate. So that's why people are looking for it. Um, they, if we do observe proton decay, then that means there has to be new physics. So that's, that's an exciting area of research um, that, that people are trying to work on. That brings up the, the possible problem of the lack of that kind of particles. Yeah, yeah. Which include an antiproton, yeah. yeah. which have decay. Yes. Yeah. Has that been a federal theoretical? Um, no, we do not know why. So when the universe was created, there should have been equal part amounts of um, antimatter matter. We don't have antimatter worlds, so there doesn't exist nearly as much antimatter as matter, and we don't know why. That's one of the things the LHC is looking for. Um, not, we, don't, we don't know if we'll find the answer to that question, but it is um, So let's move on and go back to those forces for a minute. So um, I'm going to just briefly remind you about the electromagnetic force. So uh, it's an it acts on electric charge, um, and it's very long range which means, uh, you know, essentially it's, uh, it can, you know, it doesn't matter how far away I am from it, I can feel it to a little extent. And this is because the photon is massless. Um, and actually, you can think about the way the, the strength of the force depends upon the distance. It's just, it's something called 1 over r squared law, which means it's just proportional to the distance between me and, and you. Um, the, the radius squared. So if I didn't have the microphone on, then um, the people here would hear me, um, you know, the R, so what they were, were one meter away, um, and the people at the back of the room would hear me like with um, a one over R squared PK. So they hear me a lot less. Um, so we use the electromagnetic force to transmit information in many ways. So you are always interacting with it in one way or another. So um, we use it for radio. Does anybody here hear that advertisement for this on WFNC? Yes. Okay. So um, yeah, so that's radio waves. And, and basically what radio waves are is electric, it's just electromagnetic waves. It's light. It's just the lower frequency of light. Um, and so basically what you do is you have a little charge at your transmitter. It wiggles up and down and creates a radio wave or light or a photon, another way of talking about it. Um, and then you receive it in your car or in your Radio or now, okay, now can you probably listen to it on your computer, so that's a whole different way of transmitting information, but that might have been transmitted wirelessly. And wirelessly is also just another way of transmitting information encoded in um, photons or in, in uh, electromagnetic waves. So, um, so this is kind of big where this in real life. Um, if we go down back to the weak force, and I said this is um, this uses um, it is involved in nuclear decay. So when you have a proton going to a neutron, and the reason why this is is because the weak force can change a quark of one type into another quark and into a quark of another type, which is pretty incredible. Um, and it acts on both charged and neutral particles, although it can only change charged particles from one type to another. And it's the difference between it and the weak force is that it is short range. And this is because these W and the bosons have a lot of mass. So you need to be able to create you need to use energy to create the particle itself to mediate the force. 
Um, and so that, that restricts its range. It has to be, it, um, it has to be short range because of that. And that's another reason why um, it also is much weaker than the um, than the electromagnetic force. Um, then we have the strong force. So the strong force um, basically is like a spring. So if you take a spring and you just stretch it a little bit, um, either, you know you can pull the string just a little bit pretty easily. But if you take a spring and you try to really try to stretch it, um, you'll find that it gets harder and harder to stretch it. And that's exact same, that's the same principle as um, the strong force. So if you have two cords um, and you have them pretty close together, they're they're happy um, and there's not a lot of energy between them. But then as you stretch them away from each other. Um, that uh, it becomes much, much harder to pull them apart from each other. Um, and, and so that, that, that means that a, a configuration where they're really far apart is, is um, hard from an energy perspective. And so what happens is that when you create two quarks um, and they start traveling away from each other, it's actually energetically more favorable. So it lower, lowers the total energy of the system if you create a whole other pair of quarks out of vacuum. Um, so that this cord can now be really close to a cord, and that cord can be really close to another cord, um, and and, um, and so that lowers the total energy configuration of the system. Um, and so that also means that there's a special property of the strong cords that you can never have a cord by itself. So it, it it's just it, the it, the cord has to always have one or two more cord cords as a partner. <coughs> Um, and the only exception to this is the top cork, which is so massive that it decays right away, and so it doesn't have a chance to pull another cork um, out of the vacuum like it does in the, in the, in the case of these charm forks. Mm -hmm. Questions on that? Yeah. The strong force uh, always, seems, always seems to be active in a proton. Yes. The weak force comes and goes. Yes. Uh, where does the weak force reside when it's not active? always possible. It's always, it's always possible um, for a weak interaction to occur. It just has such a lower strength than the strong force that typically these these quarks are interacting via the strong force before they'll interact via the weak force. And so basically it's because the strength of the interaction is so strong for the strong force that it kind of prevents the, the weak force from happening, uh, the weak interaction from happening. Um, when you go to higher energies, like for example at the LHD, where you're colliding two protons together, that kind of um, democratizes so that sort of democratizes um, the amount of energy available, and so in that case, the weak, work, the weak interactions do happen more frequently. But um, but otherwise, it's just that the, the force interacting so much with the strong force that they don't interact with the weak force, except for rarely. Does that, does that mean that the strong force is oscillating in strength so that occasionally the weak force can overtake it? Um, that's one way to think about it. it it's, the way I think about it is that um, it's probably it's like there's a probability at any moment in time that it'll be interacting with the strong force or something else. And so it's just that probability of interacting with the strong force is much higher than the probability of interacting with the weak force. Um, that, that's the way I think about it. But both are, both are always, always um, that's always a possibility for both. It's just one is much more probable than the other. All right, so um, I didn't mention gravity. Um, you might ask where, where is gravity in this picture if I'm talking about forces that act with particles. Uh, so gravity doesn't fit into the scenario model. And the reason for that is that it's, it's way too deep. It's 10 to the 36 times weaker than the electric force. So if we think about the sense of scales and we thought about you know, how big the universe was with respect to us, I mean, this, this, in this case, the um, gravity is that much weak. It's even weaker than that. That was 10 to the 26. Um, and this is 10 to the 36 times weaker than the electric force. And so it's completely irrelevant to elementary particles, at least on the energy scales that I'm going to be talking about here. Um, that being said, it's, it's certainly understanding gravity, and we think that it should fit in with the rest of, we should eventually fit into the standard model. Um, 
So that's being done by, you know, that's something that string theory attempts to tackle. Um, but I'm not going to discuss it at all in this course um, because it's really irrelevant on the scale of what I'm talking about. But there was a lecture from the spring of 2012 when I did the lecture notes online. So, um, yeah, they, uh, they talked about uh, string theory in, in the LHC era. All right, so now moving on to the last part of this talk, which is the importance of the Higgs boson. All right, so the Higgs is the little version of, of ours. You can actually buy a Higgs boson if you want. <laughs> the inside particles do. Um, she also makes all the other um, particles. <laughs> all right, so to talk about the Higgs boson, we need to talk about mass. Because most of you probably heard at this point is that the Higgs boson generates all the mass in the universe. So what is mass? Um, classically, uh, an object's mass determines how much it will accelerate when acted upon. So if you think back to high school physics or college physics, um, I think it's actually, so, I mean, I kind of, this, this stopped for me in college, we didn't talk about it graduate physics, but basically, what we have is that F equals MA. So what this equation is telling you is that a force that um, is exerted on, on a object is equal to its mass times its acceleration, or conversely, you know, conversely if you know how hard you push on something and you know how much it accelerates, then you know what its mass is. So that's the classical definition of mass. Um, in modern particle physics, um, a particle's mass is equivalent to its energy when it's isolated. And so we can go to Einstein's E equals mv squared. So everybody's heard that. What it means is that the energy of a particle is equal to its mass times this constant, which is the speed of light. And so when it, it, the particle's moving, there's a few more terms here, but um, when the particle's not moving, you can directly relate its energy to its mass. So that's what the concept of mass is. How does mass fit into the standard model? So the standard model would be perfectly happy to have massless particles. Um, Basically, in fact, if you had massless particles, if that W and Z boson had no mass, um, then the electromagnetic and the weak forces would actually be a part of the same force. Um, so one force to rule them all, <laughs> so to speak. Um, but since the W and Z um, bosons are massive, which you could think of as I mean, you, can, you could say it's an accident in nature, although I'll tell you in a second that it's not exactly an accident in nature. Um, it, but since they are massive, what we say is that the symmetry between the electromagnetic and weak force is broken. So these guys here, they have a severe case of symmetry breaking. This guy, if you know, think about two halves of your face or body are roughly symmetric, he's got one half upside down. So that's what we call a severe case of broken symmetry. Um, so the, the concept of symmetry is a very beautiful concept within physics. It's, um, it's a guiding principle within physics that natural laws should respect symmetries, and it was really problematic for a long time that the, the standard model uh, has broken symmetry in it. I think that Martin, on his lecture in theory, will talk about this concept um, a fair amount, fair amount more, because it really what it was part of what drove um, the search for first the development of, of the theory of uh, the Higgs theory, um, and now also has, has driven um, the search for the Higgs boson itself. So basically, we don't need mass in the standard model, or the standard model is perfectly happy without it, but we have it, so we need to go out and look for what causes it. So you enter the Higgs. So there is one way that a particle could acquire a mass. So they could have mass, and, and, and that is if there were a force that it was interacting with everywhere all of the time. So this particle is constantly interacting. Um, and the Higgs field is everywhere all the time. So what I mean by the fact that the Higgs field is everywhere all the time, it means that even in completely empty space, in a vacuum, with nothing, nothing around, the Higgs field is present and has a non-zero value. This is not the case for other forces. If you don't have an electric charge somewhere, you will not have an electric field. Um, you need to have an electric charge to have an electric field, but or a non-zero value of the electric field. But for the Higgs boson, you, the Higgs doesn't care if there's anything else that's the same in the universe. It will always have um, a non-zero value. 
And so this is what makes it different, and this is why, since there's always a case everywhere, at all times, it can create mass for particles. Excuse me. Yes? How can you say that there's a vacuum when you have a big field present? Okay, so that's, um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, it has to do with um, how you define the vacuum. If you define the vacuum as having no matter. So a field is different from matter. Um, and so what you're saying is I don't have any particles, but I do have the Higgs field. Um, and that's the best way that I can explain it. So you have no particles in the vacuum, but you do have this non-zero value of the Higgs. But can you have a field if you don't have particles? Yes. It, you for the Higgs, have the Higgs particles? Yes. Do you still have a field? Yes. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, it's a hard concept to do it because it's totally different from um, from what we have with electromagnetism. So if we talk about the energy of the field um, configuration, is that the electromagnetic um, field will have a zero value if there's nothing around. Um, this, this plot basically shows the, the strength of the field versus the, the potential. So if, um, it shows like if you have, for example, well, it, okay, it's the, it's the value, it's the potential of the field. And so, which basically means the energy of the field versus the electromagnetic field strength, and, and the lowest energy configuration is when there's zero electromagnetic field. So, it, so in the absence of any electromagnetic field, there's zero energy in that field. But for the Higgs field, if you look at the Higgs field strength, it has the lowest energy, energy configuration when there actually is some Higgs field. And so that's just naturally where it's going to sit. It's a very difficult concept to wrap your mind around, and perhaps Maureen can give you a better um, explanation for why that is. But at this point, we just take it as a fact of nature that there exists in still everywhere. Yes? Does the Higgs impart mass to the um, to the quarks? Yes, it does. And I'll we'll go over how that how it does that in a second. Yes. In that diagram on the right. Uh -huh. Am I to understand that the zero value corresponds to the horizontal arrow? So this is the value of the Higgs field strength. So this point here means no Higgs field strength. No, I thought you had an energy uh, arrow. Yes. So the zero value of that is at the, at the horizontal line, right? Yes. Oh, yes, definitely. Okay, so then you're, the, the ball is at a negative, negative value. value. Yes. This is a negative value for energy. Yes. Can you give me... The most general one is definition of energy uh, that applies universally, so that I could start to think about what the negative of that would be. Hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let me think about that. Um, I don't know that I can give you that. Um, and, and what we what we say is this is the, the 
what we call the coupling strength of the Higgs to the field. Does that make sense? And kind of think about it a little bit like electric charge. So you know that if something has a charge of plus two, it will interact more strongly with an electric field than a charge of plus one. Well, um, so that's one way to think about it. It's kind of like it's the Higgs charge. The mass is the Higgs charge. So each uh, elementary particle of each hydrogen has a different coupling constant. Yes. Yes. We don't have any for the for the quarks and the leptons. We don't have any reason to describe why the masses are the way they are, why the coupling is the way they are. That is something that we eventually hope to build a theory for, but we don't have one for now. The W and C masses are tied to the Higgs mass, so we do have distinct predictions for what they should be based off of what the Higgs mass is or vice versa. But the um, but for the electrons, for the top parts, we do not have that. Alright, so now you guys have to laugh. <laughs> I mean if you do this. Great. So can I blame the Higgs field for my day not working? Um, no. And essentially what this means is is the Higgs responsible for your mass? response to my mass, and it's, it's not, essentially. So the Higgs boson is responsible for the mass of elementary particles. It's what I said when a particle is completely isolated. However, the mass of protons and neutrons, which are what you and I are made up of, made up of is comes from the energy of the strong force. Um, so we look back at uh, this slide here, remember this shows the relative sizes of the particles in the mass. This is the proton here. This is the up and down quark, right? And they're really small. And there's three of these inside of this proton. And so the sum of the three of these does not equal the proton. In fact, it, it equals like 1% like of the total proton mass. And all the rest of that mass of the proton is in the energy of the strong force, the energy of the gluon. Um, so you can blame quantum thermodynamics for okay, not working, it's not strong force. Um, so that's an important, that's an important distinction um, for between those two steps. All right, so come to conclusion. So I hope I've shown you that this general model of particle physics describes how fundamental particles interact. It's our periodic table of, of indivisible particles. Um, and that the Higgs boson gives mass to elementary particles by being everywhere in the universe, always. And then, okay, so if you're going to bet on who's going to win the Nobel Prize on October 8th, which is Tuesday, it's a pretty good bet that Higgs and the other people who wrote the papers uh, describing the connection of will get it. So I'm sure that come, come Thursday, you will see an onslaught of presentations or, you know, things in the press about the Higgs, uh, or sorry, Tuesday, about the Higgs um, goes on and uh, what it means. So uh, let me know if you see anything really good. Huh? Um, my name is on the Higgs discovery paper. Yes, me and 3,000 other people. <laughs> <laughs> and there's another paper which is another 3,000. <laughs> so, yeah. But this is, they, they think this is, so typically when there's been a discovery in the past, there's been um, something that credits the theory and that occasionally like later something that credits the experiment. Or in some cases, it's been where there's a particular individual who had enough any contribution to um, to the experiment. Um, you know, in this case, this really only happened with 3,000 people working together. So I don't know what they can do. I mean, they're definitely gonna like, kids should get one for kids and old layers, the other guy who's alive um, who wrote one of the original papers. They should get one definitely. Um, then. I mean, yeah. We've, uh, I, I and um, all my collaborators have recently received the European Physics Prize, which is like kind of like the European, you know, one of those pre Nobel Prize things, but, you know, that's 6,000 people sharing. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone you meet on the LHC experiment is an award winning physicist. <laughs> Uh, are your slides going to be online? Yes. So I will post them. Um, so I have handouts here. Um, I will post them on the link to you or all at the bottom. Um, and then in case anybody can relate to their handout, which summarizes what we talked about.
talked about today. Uh, there's a survey to have a little bit better idea about who you are and what you're interested in getting out of this lecture series. And then there is a, um, a syllabus, which is also posted on, on that website. And I'll probably post the slides um, today or tomorrow. They're resting my uh, <laughs> new for this last time.